she's right to be shocked. Um, but there's so much more to the story um, here. And um, what else should I say about that? The title comes from the Bible. I think the, the answer to the question in the title in 25 words or less is, well, it's really difficult to reconcile the demands of this everyday world with the demands of the divine world. But it's very difficult to pull that off. Maybe impossible. It's not just the heathen who rage. I think religious people rage too in, uh, in O'Connor world, in O'Connor land. Um, and so uh, now I'll just throw out the vague question and see if anybody wants to uh, uh, talk about it. Um, are there any comments about the story as it stands that you would like to that you would like to share um, before I launch into this prepared paper about 20 minutes of talking about the manuscripts of why did the heathen rage that I'm going to share with you? Okay, anybody want to wave a hand or jump in with a comment? Yes. Somebody can unmute Heidi, yes. Hi, uh, so um, one thing that really struck me was uh, Walter's comment about the generation gap. And for some reason that struck me this time I read the story and how he kind of took pride that at least his generation could tell the truth about themselves. And I just thought, you know, when we're all kind of being called now to recognize truth in ourselves, that just seemed to me to be um, an interesting starting point. It is, that line jumps out. Um, and it might be one of the few moments in the story as published that gives you a hint that this guy is going to develop and he's going to become the main character of this of this novel and you're uh, you know as a reader you're expected to get very interested in what's going on with with Walter there's not a whole lot else in those in those four pages to uh, to lead you in that direction um uh, Jackie has a question. Yeah, Jackie. I'm, I'm not muting you, Jackie. I might have to fill something out. Where did Jackie go? There she is. Yep. There I am. Oh, there you are. Okay. I'm moving around. Hello. Go ahead. Hi. I am. I'm interested in how the the story has a, a um, an aspect of the death of the knowledge in it. And that is the character of Roosevelt, who comes in and appears to weep when he sees uh, Tillman. And in the death of Ivan Illich, right, it's the peasant. Everybody else is like, oh, is he dead yet? Or oh, I want his position. The wife is going to the opera and all of that. But the peasant that holds his legs up on his shoulders to give him relief. He says, you know, this is a small matter. And, and uh, I thought it was, I, that stuck right out to me. That was mm -hmm. a comment. That's, it hadn't occurred to me, but it's a perfectly reasonable um, comparison. I think Roosevelt is sincere in this, uh, uh, this, and I always assume that that character in Ivanich is, what's his name? The peasant's name in, in the story? Uh, Gerasim, G-E-R-A-S-I-M. G-E-R-A-S-I-M, mm -hmm. thank you. And I think Chan has a comment now. Yeah, Chan. What else? Well, first of all, um, I knew Roosevelt. He was a very lovely, gentle <laughs> black man who took care of an invalid professor at Georgia College for many years. And, um, you know, was a noble character in many ways. So that's that. But for the first time thinking about these stories, and I'm closer to the mother's age than to the son, obviously. Uh -huh. um, Thinking back on the few, well, the few stories that fit my pattern of what I'm about to say, you could probably bring up some that don't, but it just occurred to me that Flannery is almost writing about not only a society in decline, but the gene pool has run out with these children that she presents. 
And the South, um, you know, you could argue that the South was in that position at that moment, not only in its people, but in many, they had lived through a long period of time when the soil was giving out because it was overused. And um, it just hit me very strongly that she's writing about a society in collapse or decline. None of these kids are gonna be able to come forward and take care of us in our old age. <laughs> Thank you. I think Flannery is, is seeing, uh, you know, where history is taking her people. And, that, and this is in a lot of works. And I think she sees her people as the losers and she just basically ends up welcoming it. And I'm, I've always read that name Roosevelt and thought that uh, O'Connor was just making the play on FDR. There really was a Roosevelt. That's nice to know. I'll have to quote you on that. Um, okay, here we go with this, uh, with this paper, which I will read with immense charm. Okay. I think to appreciate what O'Connor was up to, in her years of working on this novel, we, th we need to think about its connections to other works. So I'll review. In 1957-58, she had written The Enduring Chill. In early 60s, she completed The Comforts of Home and The Partridge Festival. While she worked on Heathen, she completed in 61, Everything That Rises Must Converge and The Lame Shall Enter First. After she gave up on Heathen as a novel, she completed in 1964, the stories Revelation, Judgment Day, and Parker's Back. My take on the manuscripts of Heathen is that they give us insights about just, just about everything O'Connor was writing late in life. A few years ago, the O'Connor Society newsletter Cheers announced that the manuscripts of O'Connor's abandoned novel would be edited by Jessica Hooten Wilson and published as a text for the broader public not just a scholarly audience to enjoy. This won't be easy. Wilson is required by the O'Connor estate, as is the estate's usual practice, to avoid adding anything to what O'Connor wrote. Um, Jessica may have thought she was going to add something, but it was, she was reminded, no, she wasn't gonna do that. Like most people who study O'Connor, I had never taken what I called the heathen manuscripts all that seriously because I had heard that the 378 pages or so of manuscript don't really constitute a novel, that there's too much repetition, too much struggling on O'Connor's part to find her way. But once the forthcoming publication was announced, I thought I'd better pay attention. Uh, Stephen G. Driggers and Robert J. Dunn provide a chart of the development of O'Connor's fiction in their book about O'Connor's manuscripts, in which they indicate that O'Connor worked on Heathen for over three of her prime years, from near the end of 1960 until the end of 1963. And the critic Mary Burns says that O'Connor's work took place primarily in 1963. In a fascinating letter to sister Mariella Gable, also in 63, O'Connor says that she was ready to publish a book of stories, but also that she wanted to wait and see what this turns out to be that I am writing on now. If this turns out to be a long story, I'll put them all together in a collection. O'Connor is talking about heathen as this extra piece. And in the next paragraph of that letter, she shows remarkable self-doubt. Quote, I've been writing 18 years and I've reached the point where I can't do again well, do again what I know I can do well. And the larger things that I need to do now, I doubt my capacity for doing. So what might have been the larger things O'Connor felt she needed to address in fiction while trying to draft heathen? What had she never solved in fiction to her satisfaction? Assuming you will forgive my attempt to read O'Connor's mind, I'll suggest that some of her goals in composing the heathen manuscripts can be put into the following four categories. One, she wanted to write realistically about what life is like after grace is suffered and accepted, producing what Jessica Hooten Wilson calls a post-conversion narrative by placing a moment of grace early in a novel and then showing what sort of contemplative life 
and what sort of action in the world would follow. And by the way, the short section of Heathen published in Esquire makes a little progress on that score. As John R. May points out, this story as it stands is the mother's. And the mother, an interesting but minor character in the novel, finds the implied moment of grace experienced by her son, the main character, merely irritating and enraging. I should also mention here that Farrell O'Gorman compares the heathen manuscripts to Walker Percy's The Movie Goer. And O'Gorman is willing to suggest that O'Connor was influenced by Percy to try to write the religious life of a normal man. Goal number two, O'Connor wanted to write a believable love story. She tried to make the comforts of home and the Partridge Festival into love stories with mixed tentative results. This topic receives emphasis in the work on Heathen by Colleen Warren. And while O'Connor was at it, she wanted to figure out what her own life of letter writing, in which O'Connor adapted her tone to suit each of her very different correspondents had to do with romance. As Virginia Ray has suggested, O'Connor was thinking about her relationship with Marriott Lee, who once declared her love for O'Connor and whose self-portrait O'Connor kept over her fireplace for a time while working on Heathen. Three, O'Connor wanted to reach some sort of conclusion about family life perhaps to develop some sort of idea of how a mother and a father could exist peacefully in the long term with a son and daughter. The critic Anne Ruman treats the heathen material as O'Connor's ongoing contemplation of her need to improve her relationship to her mother. We could put it this way, perhaps she wanted to revisit some of her early masterpiece, A Good Man is Hard to Find, without murdering an entire family. Or perhaps, it's just the opposite. Perhaps O'Connor's goal was to justify the rage that could be felt by a child, to show that family peace is not the real goal. There's a reference <clears throat> to St. Jerome in Heathen, and one of Jerome's ideas is that a child must be cruel to a parent in order to be truly loving toward that parent. This is the sort of idea that I'm sure would intrigue Flannery O'Connor, and I can imagine her referencing, referencing St. Jerome to hint at her novel's relevance to her relationship with her mother. And four, finally, reading Flannery O'Connor's mind, she wanted to make herself reach some useful conclusions about the civil rights movement and how to solve the country's race problem. This issue is a major concern in Virginia Ray's important article about the heathen manuscripts. Ray concludes that a major reason O'Connor did not finish heathen was that she realized her initial intention to write a satire about race was wrongheaded. O'Connor's letters to Marriott Lee regularly ridicule Lee's liberalism about civil rights and their friendship conflicted with the novel's satire. The manuscript's talk of openness on race eventually, if tentatively, became persuasive to O'Connor, as it becomes persuasive to the protagonist in the manuscripts. In other words, Flannery changed her mind about race, and it messed up her novel. If we ever see a fuller version of Why Did the Heathen Rage, I think we will agree that O'Connor was challenging herself on all these fronts. It's a totally honorable effort on her part, but of course it's also understandable that O'Connor did not manage magically to pull a whole bunch of rabbits out of a hat all at once. She didn't produce what we would typically call a novel. But if the bits of heathen are assembled a certain way, I think we do have a fascinating draft of a long story that leaves one speculating, as O'Connor probably did, about what will happen after the end of the story. Jessica Houghton Wilson has a difficult but worthwhile task. Part of what O'Connor did in working on Heathen was to expand on The Enduring Chill, the rather autobiographical story from 1958 about a troubled writer who retreats to a mother's southern dairy farm to discover that death is not all that imminent. The story ends with the Holy Ghost descending from a water stain in the ceiling. It's that story. But in one draft of The Enduring Chill, 
The water stain resembles not the Holy Ghost, as in the published version, but that rather challenging and insulting priest, Father Finn. No wonder there's another draft in which the main character jumps up from the bed and flees from the room rather than be overwhelmed like the mythic figure Lita by a descending figure of divine power. One way to read Heathen, then, is to see it as a continuation of the plot about the weakened but still living main character of the Enduring Chill. Various names are applied to the main character of Heathen, but I'll stick to the one that appears most often, Walter, the one that's in Library of America edition. Like the main character in Enduring Chill, Walter is shocked to think that he is a Christian and to indict himself as a very bad one. He's unsure of what to do with his newly discovered belief. In draft after draft of the planned novel, Walter also does not know what to do with his family, all of whom are alive, father, mother, and sister. A major challenge would be for Walter to figure out how to manage the black workers on the farm also. Instead of taking direct action concerning his family or the farm, what Walter does is read a lot, especially books about medieval theology and he writes bizarre letters to newspapers and, more significantly, letters to complete strangers. Letters intended primarily to hook them and then make fun of them. It's no surprise that critic Marion Burns describes the heathen manuscripts as uncannily and coincidentally comparable to John Kennedy Toole's A Confederacy of Dunces. Walter's devotion to what his parents see as a life of inaction is made more complicated by his father's choice to prefer one of the black workers over his son. The father would, Wal would order Walter to work in the yard while Roosevelt rests. Walter's letter writing, and this is now you know, totally in the manuscripts, not what's published. His letter writing takes a crucial turn when he starts sending letters to a woman a northerner usually named Una Gibbs, O-O-N-A. Uh, at 10 o'clock this morning, somebody in that group pointed out to me that Una is an Irish name. It has something to do with a lamb. Uh, I recall that um, Eugene O'Neill, northern playwright, of Irish heritage named his daughter Una. Um, so that's how much we can make sense of that name. He starts writing letters to Una Gibbs in order to make fun of her supportive interest in an interracial communal settlement in the South. The settlement is clearly based on a real interracial community in South Georgia in O'Connor's time called Koinonia. Una is so interested in black people and so interested in Walter, that Walter finds himself pretending in his letters to be black. He even sends Una a picture of the black worker Roosevelt, and Walter tells Una that the photo is of himself. Somewhere along the way then, to complicate things further, Walter starts falling in love, more or less believably, with Una. In other situations, Walter could easily cut off one of his strings of correspondence by writing on an, envelope, on an envelope that he had died and returning that letter to the sender. But as Walter's horrified love for Una grows, his correspondence endures. Walter even finds himself defending the interracial community that interests Una, albeit in a highly emotional moment, part of an argument with his father. Um, Something like, uh, Walter says to his father, they are living the way Christ wants us to live. And you could make the case that that persuaded Flannery, that that was the line she wrote. And then she said, hey, wait a minute, I'm on the right side. I'm on the wrong side here. I can't satirize this attitude. The plot is cut short just as the fuse is lit for an explosion. We are told that Una has driven down from the north to the south in her red convertible and has arrived at Walter's farm. What we have here is potentially an ending 
to heathen, even if it is more abrupt than the ending of the life you save may be your own, which also ends without our knowing for sure what will become of any of the main characters. As I contemplate the ending of heathen, I wonder, can flesh maintain the connections established between two souls created only in letters? What will happen when Una and Walter see each other? Can love survive when it is actually between two dangerously intelligent people? Intelligence is always dangerous, and O'Connor. Will Walter grow toward more genuine concern for racial, racial issues, converted to take up some sort of life of action? Or will he adopt a more contemplative course or some sort of ideal combination of action and contemplation? And finally, can Walter remain on the farm comfortably once his parents and Roosevelt discover that Walter has been pretending to be Roosevelt? He then leaves me with the impression that O'Connor saw herself as a hot mess of puzzles she could not solve. I don't think that she ever persuaded herself that a life of religious and artistic contemplation could ever be considered compatible with a life of action. I do not think she ever persuaded herself that her own correspondence with a variety of close friends was ever entirely free of fakery. And I don't think she ever solved the problems of family life. O'Connor worked to make her main character defensible as a son, but critic Louise Westling is probably not alone in considering Walter a failure. While O'Connor completed only two stories during the three years she worked on Heathen, Everything That Rises and The Lame, she'll enter first, a shortened revision of her second novel, her spirited failure to produce a novel did set her up to make progress on various fronts that concerned her as she started drafting Heathen. One way to look at Heathen is to see it as the primordial stew that was eventually served up as the posthumous story collection, Everything That Rises Must Converge. Heathen addresses all of the shortcomings I suspect O'Connor saw when, can she, when she considered most critically the seven stories she had ready to go. And I think that as O'Connor abandoned Heathen, she was artistically prepared to compose her final three strong stories. Revelation, Judgment Day, and Parker's Bag. And in those stories, she made distinct progress on what she considered the larger things. I understand Wilson's comparing Heathen to William Faulkner's collection of linked stories, Go Down Moses. Perhaps O'Connor's final stories seem more powerful when we appreciate how they grew out of the problems of Heathen. Now I'm gonna talk about those final three stories. First, O'Connor completed Revelation, a story I think fulfills O'Connor's desire to write about what happens after a moment of grace. One way this story grows out of heathen's material is in its attention to pigs. In file 194A of Heathen, O'Connor's main character is envious of someone else's pig farming. And in file 225E, Walter is responsible for the death of a sow about to give birth. And Mrs. Ruby Turban of Revelation, like with Walter of Heathen, takes pigs very seriously and very personally. But the prolonged moment of grace is what's crucial here. Once the college student named Mary Grace hits our main character Ruby on the head with a textbook named Human Development, Ruby's contemplative life expands and blossoms. I think Revelation shows that after a moment of grace, one needs another moment of grace, which Ruby receives in the story's final paragraphs. The story leaves one the, with the impression that Ruby's continuing struggles and its ongoing uh, successes are sufficiently implied, I think, in a way that I can't quite claim for Walter in Heathen, as for the other challenges O'Connor was giving herself, I'd say that Revelation persuades me that Ruby and her husband do love each other, though how that love came about is not the story's focus. O'Connor is thinking about family life too, but she reaches conclusions only subtly and tentatively as Ruby imagines herself as a sow mother to a gang of piglets near the end. On the topic of race, I think Revelation is quite grand on showing how Ruby imagines herself black and then joins in on chastising herself for her racism. But I have always struggled to imagine how Ruby 
will find a way to carry on a conversation with her African-American workers on her farm after the story ends. More grace is always required, it seems, in O'Connor's world. On to Judgment Day. I think it can be read as making more progress on the topic of race. In some drafts, one can clearly see heathen material feeding into this story. As, for example, Walter's parents are transformed into the father and daughter in Judgment Day. O'Connor once talked about everything that rises must converge as a new sort of story for her, the sort of thing she wished she could do more of. As O'Connor worked on heathen, with Walter imagining himself black and defending an interracial commune, O'Connor set herself up for the sophisticated treatment of race in Judgment Day. O'Connor, I think, simultaneously condemns the racism of her main character, the old white man Tanner, persuades us that this racist character could imagine in detail that he loves a black man, Coleman, and also suggests that Coleman does not love Tanner back. Compare this complex relationship to the brief passage in Everything That Rises, in which Julian's mother remembers her mammy, Caroline. And I think we can see O'Connor making progress on the subject of the complicated future of race relations. For more evidence of O'Connor's focus on the future in Judgment Day, notice also the inclusion and acceptance directed toward the multiracial character called Dr. Foley, for whom white people will someday wish to work. In Parker's back, O'Connor writes, I think, her most effective story about her romantic relationship. And once again, I think we can conclude that the work on Heathen prepared for O'Connor's success, this time with an unsentimental and believable treatment of romantic love. O'Connor had tried many times to suggest romantic connections, from Mrs. Flood's final interest in Hazel Motes to Holga's repeated yes in response to Manly Pointer's need for a profession of her love, to Thomas's obsession over Sarah Ham and the comforts of home, to the manuscripts of the Partridge Festival, one full draft of which makes quite explicit that Calhoun is falling in love with Mary Elizabeth. The Partridge Festival is the last story O'Connor completed before starting on Heathen, and when one compares the drafts of Partridge to the finished story, one sees O'Connor pulling back, making safer points about similarities between Calhoun and Mary Elizabeth not claiming that their war could lead to love. In the heathen manuscripts, Walter and Una are another couple O'Connor tries to make fall in love. But perhaps they are only in love with fantasies about each other. When Una walks into Walter's, into Walter's house, chaos will surely result, and one wonders how O'Connor might have tried to finesse the survival of that relationship. When O'Connor started in on Parker's back, she went farther than she had before in making sure that both O.E. Parker and Sarah Ruth Cates are clearly seen by each other. Sarah Ruth has eyes like ice picks, so we know she is fully aware of what she's getting into when she marries Parker and becomes pregnant by him. And what better way to draw, full, to draw attention to the full physical reality of Parker than to cover him with tattoos? Both Sarah Ruth and Parker outspokenly reject the looks of the other, but I think O'Connor's strategy is to make dislike a reinforcement of love. A bit from Heathen that made it into the excerpt published in Esquire is instructive here. Walter repeats a passage from the satirical letters of St. Jerome that insists love should be full of anger. This quotation makes it some more, somewhat more believable, at least to me, that Walker loves Una. In Parker's back, O'Connor pushes the idea even further and to more successful effect, persuading us that all the expressions of anger that Sarah Ruth and Parker throw at each other are also evidence of affection. When Parker finally admits that all along that was what he wanted to please Sarah Ruth, I think O'Connor has made her best case that two of her characters love each other precisely because anger leads to and intensifies love. 
I want to ask Colleen Warren, who's done some of the most important work on the heathen manuscripts, whether she agrees with me that O'Connor made Walter and Una into O.E. Parker and Sarah Ruth Cates. Colleen Warren politely declined to um, endorse my theory, but I'm sticking to my guns here. Of course, Una is quite different from Sarah Ruth, but I find particularly persuasive the drafts of heathen featuring a character I have yet to mention called Gunnels. Gunnels works on Walter's farm, and he has a tattoo of Christ on his back. The face comes from an artwork called The Crucifixion by Matthias Grunewald, it's from way back, and the misery on that face of Christ and its um, impressive signs of skin disease are so shocking that Gunnels, this is in the manuscript, says he had nothing to do with selecting this image for a tattoo. The person who is truly impressed by the Christ tattoo, Christ tattoo, and indeed overwhelmed by it, is Walter. So my speculative theory is that O'Connor combined parts of Gunnels, his tattoo and his lack of intellect, along with the profound reaction to the face of Christ on Walter's part, to create the character O.E. Parker. And then O'Connor came up with Sarah Ruth to be the partner who could fully see and be angry with and then love the tattooed man. When I think of all the connections between the heathen manuscripts and all the stories in the collection, Everything That Rises Must Converge, I find myself endorsing something like Jessica Houghton Wilson's idea that heathen could be presented as a collection of loosely linked stories that also approaches being a novel. The critic Stuart Burns once insisted that all the good material in heathen found its way into the stories and, and everything that rises must converge. And he too has a point. Whereas O'Connor worried that she needed to work to make sure that her final collection of stories demonstrated variety, that she needed to work to disguise the overlaps among stories. I think that recasting Heathen as a long story within the final collection would give us a more consistent working out of O'Connor's progress on the themes of race, religion, and romance. It probably wouldn't make a popular success. I can already imagine the complaining book reviews about a new book that looks too much like an already published story collection. But there are plenty of people in the scholarly community, at least, who would enjoy reconsidering the products of O'Connor's final years. Perhaps the best course, the one I imagine I would take if it were up to me and it's not, is to admit a version of Why Did the Heathen Rage? as a long story, along with the Partridge Festival, which O'Connor once intended to include, why not, into an expanded version of O'Connor's final collection. It would be nice to admit also some of the fascinating variants in the drafts of other stories. That way, the title of that final collection might take on some more meaning, as it would be much easier to appreciate how everything in O'Connor's late work does indeed Converge. Thank you very much. Now I read that. I read that ra rapidly enough, so we still have lots of time <laughs> for, uh, for questions and uh, you know rereadings of those late three, those three last stories that are completely different from <laughs> what I'm um, making of them. Uh, you know, my understanding, by the way, is that. Uh, Publication of Why Do the Heathen Rage as a novel is not forthcoming anytime soon. And I've been reminded that I recently did talk to Jessica Houghton Wilson and I um, offered to publish a story version of Why Do the Heathen Rage if she wanted to give up on all the complications and declare victory and, and, um, um, and get the thing public, published. It seems to me that everybody who works through all these manuscripts of this novel gets really interested in them. And um, I thought the major stumbling block to uh, publication was going to be that the story didn't reach an ending. But when I saw about three drafts where Una has arrived and, you know, the major conflicts are inevitable, after you finish the story, everybody's going to find out everything about the truth here. 
um, Walter is going to be very uncomfortable. I thought, that's enough of an ending. Um, it's, um, um, everybody's going to be enraged. Uh, and lots of people are going to have moments of recognition. You know, we're going to have lots of moments of grace on all, on all fronts as a story. And so I, I still think someday we'll see something, but we don't know, we don't know uh, what it will be. Okay, we have Deborah here. Hold on. Deborah. I just pushed you on mute. Does it tell you? Yeah, there you go. Okay, yeah. So um, yesterday I was participating in a faith in fiction course with Jessica Hood and Wilson. Oh! Yeah, and What's she mentioned... Say? Yeah, she mentioned that she's working these manuscripts for publication. Um, and she said that she expects to have something to send to the estate to read in six weeks. And I was like... Six weeks well, from yesterday? Yeah, she said this yesterday. So I imagine she, she really believes that. And then there, she said something that really, I don't know, because I asked, we are talking about the violent buried away. And I asked her about because in the manuscripts there is uh, like something different with the burnt cross uh, in the violent buried away. I asked her about that and she said she she used part of this in the why do the heathen rage and I was like what? <laughs> I don't know. I, I thought this so I don't know if you know anything about that but what I wanted to Okay ask, but you said it now so let's repeat that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She, she said it so now. <laughs> Some of the material in the violent bear away. The violent bear away. Didn't the get into the lunchal in her first. Uh huh. Cross burnings, for example. Jessica is proposing to put into and this think. one. Yeah. Wow. And, and then, and then, well, but anyway, that's just a piece of information. I don't know what to think of that. But I wanted to ask if you think if you see there's any relation to these manuscripts with um, a view of the woods because what got my attention was the name Tillman and that was the same name of the businessman in a view of the woods and also a uh, composed uh, like Mary we had a Mary Fortune there and they now have Mary Maud and Mary Grace and these names keep coming back so if your opinion on that if there is anything to do because I didn't go through this manuscript so I don't know <laughs> There has to be something, it never crossed my mind. You know, I, I, I mean, what crossed my mind was, well, okay, this is shorthand for saying all Walter's family cares about is having a successful farm. They want him to be a businessman. They don't want him thinking about um, theology. They just want him to figure out how to make this farm make a profit. Maybe that's what it is. Um, when O'Connor reuses an, a character name, I think it always has to mean something. She doesn't do it trivially. And, and I, I think if we thought about it for a while, we would come up with all sorts of competing theories about uh, you know, what the comparison between Tillman and Tillman. Tillman is the guy who runs the store where, where um, uh, Mary Fortune Pitts has one of her blow up fits because she realizes that, Pitt, that um, uh, Tillman is about to buy the piece of land that she wants to that she wants to save, right? Um, and so, you know, the man who cares about the till, I uh, said, well, that's what that's what that means. Uh, and if if you if you read Tillman that way, then the mother in the published excerpt is the spokesperson for that attitude. She wants the son to become a more successful version of his father uh, than the father can be now. She wants him to be a Southern gentleman and take charge and uh, do things and, and continue what's been going on for a long time in the, in the family. And, and Walter says, I'm not up to that. Well, he's gonna be up to other things that are probably more valuable in O'Connor's eyes, probably a whole lot more valuable in O'Connor's eyes than, than, running, a, than running a farm. Um, okay, what Karen, else? Karen very kindly has shared a picture of 
the Christ figure you talked about. Oh, Grunwald? Yes, let, and let me share my image, share my screen and I can show it to you all. Ooh, I can share my screen. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, share the screen. This will be my first chance to see a good reproduction of the what I just be it's off the internet, so <laughs> it is not letting me share the screen. Oh, it's not letting you share the screen. Well, yeah. we can all go to the internet. Where did you find it, Karen? I just um Googled it. It's um Matthias Grunewald. It's the Isenheim altarpiece. Yeah. It it I probably see Christ what you saw. Plagued. Yeah, it's just a, on the internet just to get a visual. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the Byzantine Christ on Parker's back is hardly sweet and pleasant, but I would say it's not as um, horribly grotesque as the, the, uh, uh, the Grunewald crucifixion, that, like trying to create uh, maximum disgust on the part of the on the part of the viewer, I would say. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, what was O'Connor thinking going from that image to you know the description and the uh, story of what the of what the tattoo looks like? Yeah. Can I ask a question? Or yeah, go ahead, and then we'll one, have Jackie after you. One thing you said, um, Dr. Gentry, was that that caught my attention because I can't quite get the relationship between Walter and Roosevelt. You said Walter is pretending to be Roosevelt. What can you elaborate on your thought? I mean, what do you what do you mean by that? I guess. Oh, he writes uh, Una a letter, and he says, "Here's my picture," and it's a picture of Roosevelt. Oh. He goes and he talks to Roosevelt and he has Roosevelt tell, you know, tell him some things. And then he tries to channel Roosevelt in his, in his writing. And, you know, he's, he's, he's playing this game with Una, the race liberal, and he's feeding her these lines he's picked up from the black guy. And Roosevelt has no idea he's being used this way. He has no idea what's about to happen when Una drives up. And uh, for a long time, I think Walter's plan is that he's going to humiliate Una by telling her that he's fooled her, that he's tricked her. But then he finds that he really likes her too, and he can't figure out a way out of the out of the uh, um, the fix that he's in. Um, uh, Ruth Rennish, uh, Rennicke, uh, I forget how to pronounce her last name, who just wrote a book about O'Connor from Mercy University Press. She says that the passage in the Manuscripts of Heathen, where uh, Walter has got all these photographs he's taken, and he's trying to uh, assemble them so that he can figure out how to use them, that that was her inspiration for writing her book the way she did, with, with her emphasis on... Um, uh, the manipulation of visuals in all of in all of uh, O'Connor's works. So, you know, she was reading that part of the manuscript very carefully. I think Jackie is wanting to. What else, Jackie? I just wanted to comment on the difference between the Western religious art and the crucifixion and the icon that she chooses. And the Orthodox icon is not realistic. Um, it is. A, a majestic and I think sympathetic image. There's a character, well, the prince in The Idiot says he's looking at a, a Western rendition of the crucifixion. And, you know, the face is yellow and purple. That's in the library. You, know, you see the, those pictures in her book, the art book. But uh, the prince says, you could, you, you could lose your faith looking at this image that there is no way there is no resurrection here there is no glorification of the flesh you know and uh, so and she's writing these three stories you know in the last story she finishes so soon uh, before she dies 
And I, I think it's relevant, you know, that, that kind of image that is uh, in Parker's back and that too, you can Google it, um, the, you know, the mosaic. Yeah. I think that's a good point. I hadn't thought of it quite that way, but she's moving away from super realism to something else, something um, better when she, when she changes how she describes the tattoo. Cheryl makes an interesting point. Cheryl? Uh, yes, when I um, initially read the story, my interpretation of Roosevelt was that he was a much older man, more of a contemporary of Tillman, rather than being young like Walter. So it, it confuses me that Walter would have sent a picture of Roosevelt, unless it were a picture of a much younger Roosevelt. Um, the lines that she wrote um, when Roosevelt saw Tillman, he, he, it says he peered forward at what was on the stretcher. The bloodshot veins in his eyes swelled. And, and that sentence alone made me think of an older man. An older um, man. And then all at once, you know, uh, tears glazed them and glistened on his black cheeks like sweat. Good, good point. And all the manuscripts are sitting over there in a shutdown library <laughs> across the way. It'll be a while before anybody can check on that fact. So, uh, we also have George, too. George. Yes, um, uh, just a couple of things. One, I think I want to sh uh, second what Cheryl was saying about the age of Roosevelt. And I took it that the, um, the sort of sympathetic um, communication that was going on between the two men was some kind of indication that they had uh, been uh, friends of some sort for for many years, and so there was there was genuine sadness on the part of of Roosevelt for uh, what was happening to to his his friend, and also that that there was. Um, well, I, I mean, there was a there was a kind of friendship. I mean, even if you think in terms, you know, Aristotle writes about the possibility of friendship between superiors and inferiors. So even if you want to keep within that framework, it looks like these two men um, certainly had a kind of love for one another. But the, but the other thing that that strikes me um, is that there seems to be something of irony going on between Walter and his mother in the exchange about who ought to run the farm. Uh, the, because Walter is saying to her, look, you're really better suited for the purpose than I am. And I think there seems to be a kind of self-awareness there that um, the mother doesn't recognize that in fact he is a new man like it or not well he's some kind of combination of the old man and the new man uh -huh. the old man in the sense that he's idle he doesn't want to work but but a, but a new man in that he wants to leave behind um, the old, the old way. Mm -hmm. The mother, on the other hand, strikes me as somebody who belongs to the old way. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah. I don't know. I can't help but think that there's some, some really strong irony present in what's going on between the two of them. I don't know what you think about. That. Yeah. yeah, I don't think anybody's ever going to run this farm properly ever <laughs> again. This farm is in a bad is in a bad way uh, from, from here on out. I, I can't recall a good sign about the future of the farm anywhere in these uh, um, in these manuscripts. We're just we're just waiting to see how things are going to fall apart in the future. I think. Yeah. Oh, George, you need to unmute. Okay. Just one, just one uh, further question. I want to ask you. Just listening to you talk about the manuscripts 
I found myself laughing out loud. And I was just wondering about that. Did you have that experience? We all know that O'Connor can be extremely, extremely funny. humorous. So yes. I, I, in listening to you, I found myself laughing at some of the things that, that you were revealing. And I just wondered about your experience in, in reading the manuscripts. Did you? Oh, yeah. That? Um, this is one of our, this is one of our um, points of disagreement at home. Uh, my wife really just does not get why I think Henry O'Connor is funny. I also can laugh over Kafka and, uh, you know, for my wife, all of this stuff is just horrible and terribly serious and don't you laugh at that. Uh, but, you know, I turn everything and I turn everything into that kind of, uh, what, absurd direction so I can... Um, laugh at it. That, that always seems to me to be fun. Now, part of why I probably don't take advantage of any opportunity to see Roosevelt as an older man is that I think O'Connor is introducing um, her game of, of having a parent pick somebody to be a substitute child for their biological child. And so part of the psychological family uh, game that's being played here is that Tillman is trying to prove to his son that he's not a bad parent because look how nice he can be to, to Roosevelt. So even, it's in, even if it's inappropriate for uh, Roosevelt to be treated as uh, a younger man, and that may be the case, I'll have to check on that. Uh, I think Tillman is looking at him and saying, um, He's a he's a preferable version of my uh, of my son. You know, there's some ambiguity. Uh, I have I can read Revelation and say that Mrs. Turpin is a mother to Mary Grace and a daughter to Mary Grace's mother. That they're both playing games with Mrs. Turpin, using her as a prop and attributing to Mrs. Turpin different ages for the sake of their own. Um, game playing in that story. So I think age is fluid and age is fluid in O'Connor. Young people can be old and old people can be young. Yeah, there's a grand generalization. Right? What else, folks? Final comments? Oh, we have uh, Vic Vicky. Victoria. You done mute. Yeah. You have to push on mute there, too, Vicki? Unmute. Okay, yeah, there, there you go. go. Okay. Um, I'm going back to um, a st the enduring chill. The um, Hearing everybody talk about the Mary so-and-so and Mary so-and-so and Mary so-and-so, and, -so and, -so and she, of course, was Mary Flannery. Um, and... Um, in the enduring chill, the sisters um, Mary George, mm -hmm. and I started. I I know that a lot of times the names are really critical, and I wondered if um, she the last the family name is Fox mm -hmm. George Fox who was um, the founder of the Quakers. Mm. Mm. And I wondered if that was deliberate. I mean, was that, was that on purpose? Well, everything's on purpose in O'Connor. I don't know if she's thinking about if she's thinking explicitly about about Quakerism, I think when she when she has a series of characters who share her first name with her, she's just begging us to ask, "What's this got to do with Tony O'Connor's life?" All those statements that she made about, "I'm not writing my own life. I'm not writing my own life." That's not true enough. You know, she, of course, she's trying to distance their stories from her life, but she's in everything. She's all over the place. She's Walter. 
you know, um, I think that that's easy enough to see. Um, and there's just no end to the autobiographical connections that that uh, one can make. Um, yeah, and you'll recall that um, Mary George recommends that her brother be given shock treatments in um, um, the Enduring Chill. Uh, Mary Maud in the dress, well, that's one of the names attached to the sister in the, in the manuscripts of, of Heathen. Mary Maud uh, doesn't have a whole lot of use for her, for her, uh, for her brother. Uh, it's it's not a it's not a happy family. It, it, you know, there's just the the feeling that somebody wants this family to figure out how to live together, but you never you never get much of a hint that it's about to happen. And after a while, you stop you stop thinking that that's really the goal. You stop wishing for um, for the problems to be solved. You just have to lean back and enjoy the watching the problems play out. All right. We have a great uh, recommendation from Monica, but I don't know. Do you want to speak, Monica, or are you all right? Sure, Monica. Talk, talk, talk. Yeah. Hi, Monica. I I'm muted you, yeah. Yeah, I just, I read this article yesterday, and there's this great reading of Mary Grace and Mrs. Turpin as uh, Mrs. Turpin being one possible future self of for Mary Grace. Um, her facing her mother versus Mrs. Turpin is two kind of options for her future and being terrified by both of them. Um, so yeah, and it, it, there's a lot of interesting readings in that article. Sure. It's, it's brand new. Sure. And of course, Mary Grace and her mother are both versions of Marriott Lee and her, and her mother. Uh, there's Carol right there. <laughs> Still working on that topic, I'll bet you. And Flannery would put herself and other people into the same character. She would put a little piece of herself into more than one character at the same time. And she, every possible combination of how you put yourself and everybody you know into the fiction you're writing, Flannery seems to come up with that at, uh, at some point. And, you know, quite often it just, uh, you know, turns into gold. All right, all right. I think we're set. Bruce. Okay, thank you. It's been wonderful to see all these faces, and uh, someday we'll have a meeting together. And... I know we'll have a, we'll have a big old time together. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for making me happy. Now I can go back to my hiding place. And... Okay, <laughs> take care, everybody. Right. Have fun. Right. Thank you, folks. Bye. <laughs>